failure is a part of our job as, as creators. You have to fail to learn from your mistakes. And someone can't just teach you every little aspect of it. There's still failure involved. So you still need to go out and create stuff. Welcome to the podcast, Tapping Creativity, with myself, Matthew C. Temple. And each week, we're going to dive into questions and issues and inspiration around creativity and the creative process. Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of Tapping Creativity. And this week I am joined by a filmmaker who has similarities I I felt when we first got to know each other uh, in sort of how he started and how I've started and how I see a lot of other people just kind of jump into this world and almost as though I don't even know what I'm doing yet. And now I'm doing it and now I got to figure out what I'm doing while I'm doing it. You know, a filmmaking is such a unique uh, art form in that so many of us start and we have no idea what we're doing. When you start, say, if you started a job as a professional illustrator, you probably should know what you're doing. But that's kind of not the case for filmmaking. And so I thought this would be a really fun episode and to bring Taylor Lewis on, who is with us today. And Taylor started his career with his brothers by actually lighting each other on fire and then filming it in their parents' backyard. That's a story we'll have to hear about. After a few trips to the hospital, they decided for some weird reason they were going to keep going with this. And uh, so Taylor, along with his brothers, uh, started their uh, their production company. They've been making, sounds like a lot of branded content and stuff for like Amazon and Microsoft. And it's brought them sort of all over the globe, which is pretty cool. So we'll hear about that in a moment. Um so, uh, you know, I didn't light my brothers on fire as my way to get going in this world. But as I said, it was also, well, uh, let's jump in and, and, and see what it's like. So I'm curious to hear your way into this. But, uh, but first, welcome, Taylor, and thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't want to spend too much time in origin stories. Those are fine for uh, uh, for Marvel movies and superhero movies. Generally, what's actually more interesting is what keeps your fire burning, where you draw your inspiration, where are the challenges, the way you overcome it. We'll take a little superhero uh, uh, saga moment and get a, a little insight into your origin. Cool. I like that you call it origin story because that's exactly what I call it. <laughs> and I think of it just because I'm a big fan of Marvel. And so that's something I always gravitate to. But yeah, like you said, me and my two brothers were from um, a small town in northern Utah. And yeah, we just lit each other on fire. And basically, we just thought it was we thought we always think fire is kind of interesting, to, interesting to film. And so that's what we did. There was nothing else to do in this small town. So we just did that. And we we actually came up with some pretty odd contraptions um, as far as like to film fire. Like we would take my dad's old tube socks, fill it with sand, dip it in gasoline, light it on fire and then like throw it through the air. And it made like a really cool like fireball effect. And we would do that and try to dodge them on the other side of the yard and film it. Um, it was pretty cool. Um, my brother Rhett did get lit on fire that moment because he didn't dodge one correctly. But anyway, <laughs> he was totally fine. He didn't have to go to the hospital. He was wearing like a big puffy jacket. And so like it just got got the jacket on fire and it looked really awesome anyway. And then we made a few other things to like shoot fire out of the ground, like fl flamethrowers through the air. And it was like really bare bones type of stuff. Basically, if YouTube was around when we did all this, we'd probably be already YouTube famous for all the weird stuff and like dangerous stuff we would have done. So you would you would you would have been like you would have been you would have been uh, uh, sort of Jack, you know, the jackass juniors. Basically, yeah. that's kind of what we did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Anyway. And like you were saying in, in the intro, like we from there, we realized like as we were filming all this type of stuff, we were just doing it for fun. But then we realized that we really liked doing it. We we thought it was a really kind of interesting thing to do to go out and make movies and make content. And so we built that into a production company like when we were in high school and um, after high school, it took a long time for us to kind of find, you know, make money because going into this industry and never like going to college or like learning from anyone else. Like we kind of like, we just learned by trial and error. Like we made a bunch of mistakes and, um, we weren't, we obviously weren't very good and it took us a while to kind of find our voice and, and really learn how to tell authentic real stories. 
Um, and then like after five to six years, we, we kind of met these filmmaker mentors, um, and they kind of helped us kind of hone our craft and helped us like get bigger and better clients basically. And that kind of speaks to a little bit of what we're, what I was talking about at the beginning. This is something that you start and you, you keep learning and, and, you know, you're not very good when you start. And I don't know that anybody really is. And once you've gotten to the point where you're so good at it, that you can kind of do it really well each time, then it's actually, you need to push yourself to find the next challenge, the next thing that's going to basically make you feel like you're a novice and you don't know what you're doing. And I'm wondering how that's sort of how that's even played because for you, when you get to that point where you're like, oh, we've learned something and we finally like did something that, you know, that was that that we feel really proud of in a new way and it's been recognized or we've been hired to do this you know a project and it and it turned out really really great and then now i have a new story problem i have a new something to solve and how do you work with that where you've had some success but then you're starting also that you start back at the beginning on your next project yeah um i think uh, something I can talk about towards that is just like you always like for us when we first started, um, we like when we got our first chance to do like a like an ad for like um like this big uh, multi million dollar ad campaign was we were doing mini documentary style videos. So we go to a city, film this person for two or three days, and then and we didn't do much pre production work for that. We kind of just went there, shot them, came home, and then had to find the story within the edit because that's kind of how you work documentary style stuff. And um, then like a few years of doing like we did that for five or six years and then we started doing more like scripted content because then we got Amazon as a client. And so we started doing more narrative pieces uh, for that for their um, – because we've done videos for a Kindle video commercial and we've done – uh, commercial for we did the launch commercial for Amazon Prime Music. We did the launch commercial for the Amazon Echo, and um, there, like that, was a huge challenge because we came from like a documentary style world, so narrative pieces were hard for us, like at the beginning. And so it was really that was kind of a nice challenge, like doing a different genre of the commercial world, and um, so that's kind of like kind of how you were saying, like the way we learn is by switching up the type of content that we create with the different um, clients that come our way. Like just like a couple of years ago, we started doing work for a news outlet and that's a whole different type of um, learning curve because we're normally used like at like for commercials, we're used to having like a deadline uh, two to three weeks or like a couple months out. Yeah. But like with a news organization, Tomorrow. we go and shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. It was like we shoot that day at all night. It's up the next morning and it's like two weeks of that in a foreign country. And like that was a learning curve. And that was like, OK, well, I need to be a lot faster with editing. I can't take two weeks to edit a piece. I got to edit a piece in six hours. And if it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. You just got to go with it. And so, so that's kind of like when you jumped into this sort of next big, you know, one of your big clients or one of those those big shifts, I'm guessing you had a moment or two where something happened where a client was displeased with a certain, you know, draft or there was something where you felt like, oh my God, we came this far and now like, are we going to mess it up? Did you have any of those? And if you did, I'd love to hear that story. Um, well, as far as mess ups on set, like there's, we've had tons of mistakes that we've made. I can tell you a recent story that we just did in a second, but like there's always a moment, um, I don't know if you're exactly hinting towards this, but there's always a moment. Every single set I go on, it doesn't matter. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And every time I go on a set, I'm still nervous that I'm going to make a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. know, like I know how to work our cameras. I know how to work our gear. I know how to set up a light to make a shot look pretty. But I, every time I go on a set and we always have like, it's like the first day or the first couple hours, I'm like, am I really good at my job? <laughs> Do I know what I'm doing? But it's like, I like that feeling. I, there's a quote, I think Steven Spielberg says something about that or some other famous director where like, if you don't feel nervous when you're on set, like then you're not on your toes and you're not going to like create like good content. The like having that little bit, bit of nervousness means you're not comfortable. And 
you need it. Like everyone says, you need to be out of your comfort zone to, to grow and stuff like that. Yeah. There's that place where you kind of have, you do, you need to be like, Oh, because then, I mean, if you, if you can be where you're totally comfortable in this, then you're actually shifting. Hopefully you're actually in your craft, not necessarily in your creativity. And what I mean by that is your craft is, you know, how to use your camera. You never have to show up and be like, Oh, I don't know how to get this shot. You know how to get the shot usually, right? But that is the craft part. The The creative part is how am I going to, what am I going to do in this shot in order to make this unique, in order to make this special, in order to tell this story in this way that I want to tell it. When it comes to actually putting the camera up and hitting record and doing that stuff, so that you know how to do. And I think that becomes a little bit of that distinction between yeah. where you do feel comfortable, you know, uncomfortable. Like last night, my daughter called me, she's doing a video for an application. You know, she's taken one film class in college. So, uh, her editing skills are not great. The software was holding her back. She's like, I want to do this thing, but I don't know how to do that. You know, so she has a creative idea, but the creativity wasn't her problem. It was the craftspersonship as it were. Right. I don't know how to use the tools well enough. So the tools are holding me back, not my creativity. And then we get to a point where I know the tools. Now the tools aren't holding me back. Instead, it's my own creative limitations that are holding me back. Right. Yeah. That's actually, that's a cool way to put it. I've never actually thought of it that way, but yeah, that's totally what it is. Yeah. That's way cool. Um, but like going back to like a story, like, um, about when we, I, we didn't really make a client mad. I don't know. There's. I can't really think of a moment on set where we ever went like the client's been really annoyed with us. We always do really best to keep our clients happy with us. And to that point, like we pride ourselves on two things within our company. And the first thing is like we tell really good stories. Like that's one thing that we really know how to do very well. Um, and then the second thing is that we're really easygoing and great to work with. And that's the two things that we, no matter what project we work on, we know we have to tell a really good story and we have to be good to that client. And that's really paid off for us a lot in our career. Um, and one example is like recently, oh, I was a few months ago, we were on set filming like a higher profile client. And when you're, and it was just kind of a simple setup where the client comes in, sits down, reads the teleprompter. Um, he has like a certain message he wants to, sh to say, reads the teleprompter, does it the, like two takes, gets up and leaves. And that's kind of sometimes how higher profile clients kind of work. You only have like one or two takes. I don't know what status you get in life where it's like <laughs> you can walk in a room, do two takes, whatever the takes are, you're done and you're out of there and everyone has to deal with it. And it's an interesting point in life. But what happened on set was like something happened with the audio recording and um, we got zero audio, like usable audio in that whole piece. And the guy left the building. He was in the parking lot about to get in his car. And we were like, and that's when we found out the audio was bad. And we're like, crap, we got to call him back up. And like the people, his like secretaries and like the other people that kind of run his life for him. Um, we were, it's always awkward. It's awkward when you have, to, when you have a mess up like that, we had to go up and be like, Hey, we need to come back up. Is that okay? And they, because we're really good friends with them and they like us, and because we've been so easygoing over the last few years of working with them, they were very willing to let them come back up. And it was a completely, it was an okay situation. Like mm -hmm. we can never have that happen again with the client <laughs> because then they'd probably get mad. But like that was one of the mess ups that happened. He came back up and he did it and he actually did that take. That, that was the best take that he did was that third one. But it was really awkward and it was a, a completely like technical thing that we just didn't foresee and like mess ups happen like that on sets and you kind of got to roll with them. And if you have a good relationship with that client, like you, they're more forgiving in those situations. For sure. For sure. You mentioned at one point that you made a feature film for a thousand bucks. You had a decent festival run. I'm curious if you can tell us about it first of all. And secondly, if it's available somewhere, tell us where, and also make sure to send me a link too, so we can share it in the show notes. So this is the feature we made for under a thousand was our first feature film. So it was made a number of years ago. Since then, we've worked on other stuff, but it's called Billy was a deaf kid. The reason we made it was because it was in the beginning parts of our career where we didn't have any other clients. And so we had nothing else to do. So, so we were like, you know what? 
and we had these film ideas that we wanted to make, but it's really hard to get funding for films. It's so difficult. And especially when it's your first. And so we were just like, you know what? We're just going to go out and shoot this movie. We have this concept. Um, we have a bunch of friends and we have, a, we come from a big family. So my older brother and his wife acted as the two main characters. My other brother was the third, like the side character and our friends and family did all the supporting cast of that. And it was such a slow budget. And our mom was even on set running the boom mic sometimes and like, and moving lights for us. And that's how small of a set was. It was our mom was helping us. Anyway, the movie is just about like this. It's just a quirky like relationship movie. It's the type of movie where you either love it or you hate it. In the premiere, it, it played at Cinequest, which is nice. one of the top 10 film festivals in, in the world. And um, in that premiere, 30 people walked out in the first 10 minutes of the movie. And those people hated the movie. And then after the movie, there was people that came up to us and was like talked about how much they loved it. And so it's this weird like you will you're either going to really like it or you're just going to really hate it. And it's kind of just like so interesting to us that there's like no middle ground about this film. I'll, I'll see if I can be the middleman for you. Yeah, but it, <laughs> you can I can find a link for you. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it was a really fun film and it was really cool um, just doing like the festival circuit for it. Um, we haven't done film like like we haven't done the festival circuit in a while. And it's. We we may have had a lot of fun with it. Like in the in the film, there's this moment. Well, there's a ongoing theme where they get this couch and kind of ride it around. It's like on wheels, and so it's like their mode of transportation. It's kind of iconic in the film. So every festival we did go to this um, with, we brought the couch along with us nice. and gave people couch rides in the street as a form of marketing for the film, and. So that made us pretty popular amongst the festivals. Whenever we went, people always from everywhere would come just to ride the couch. I don't even think they, some of them probably didn't even watch the movie. They would just come to sit on the couch, take a picture and go riding around on it. And that was super fun. That's um, awesome. I love that. And I think cool that's experience. so important because, you know, uh, those are the things. And, and I'm a guest when you look back on it, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like you can look back and be like, oh, that, that was a first feature wasn't great like it has some things that are special like even if you go back and you watch like the puffy chair did you ever see the uh the duplis mm -hmm. brothers it's like yes was their that first was feature. a big inspiration i loved that movie but not because it was a great movie uh i loved that movie because first of all they just did it for not a lot of money their camera had autofocus so like they moved the camera and all of a sudden it's like and it was not like good autofocus like mm -hmm. oh wait shoot where's that where's that thing where i'm supposed to focus on oh there it is okay but they had a, and I'll give this away for, for people who, who haven't seen the movie, but within the first couple minutes of the movie, Mark Duplass's character standing outside his like girlfriend who's breaking up with him outside of her, her apartment. And he's holding his boom box up and he's like playing a song and I forget what song it is. You know, he's holding it a little bit in that sort of iconic John Cusack moment. Right. And she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I couldn't find my Peter Gabriel CD. That, you know what? He's got me for a while. Like, I'm going to give him a whole lot of leeway. So there's one other scene that's kind of about halfway through the movie that also really helps keep that, that, that movie going. Is it a great movie? No, it's not a great movie at all. It didn't need to be a great movie. It had a few moments that were so wonderful that it carried the rest. And it was a, it was a couple of guys like making their first feature film, right? And, the, and they're, they're now basically Hollywood royalty. And I think one of the things you're talking about is just like, oh, we don't have anything to do. We've got, let's just like go do something and have our mom help us out. And you know what? It also could have been a total disaster. It could have played at the like film festival down the street from where you live that plays like two movies and the only the people from the neighborhood come and watch it and they like it only because they know you. And that would have been totally okay too. It's like yeah. you did it. And and we've had our fair share of those as well, <laughs> like at the beginning, <laughs> having our own like mini short film film festivals where we invited all our friends to it and hosted it at our local church that had a, a movie screen that we could put it up on, you know. Um, and like another funny thing, too, about that film, like like you said, there were some definite mistakes in our first film. We actually missed. I can't remember exactly what it is, but like um, our Third, like our supporting character, Billy, in the film, who um, 
Also, if you look at the poster of it, like this Billy was a death kid. Billy in it has this huge like um, Fisher Price radio on his head. And because the main character, Archie, believes it can make him here. Um, anyway, it's just a really cool image. And it's one of the it's in all of our posters. But Billy didn't really have a character arc in it. Like he kind of is the same throughout the whole film. And we found out later that we missed like I think it was being at um, Slam Dance. Um, because Billy didn't have a character arc. Like if we would have just put like a little bit of a character arc on him, would have made it in. Yeah. And it was just, it's just things like that. It's like, oh, there's that element of storytelling we didn't really know about beforehand, but we now, we know it for our later stuff that we did and have, and are currently doing now. Um, so it's the, one of those things where you learn as you go. And we were very fortunate to make a good enough film to make it in one of those top 10 film festivals and be able to go out and do stuff with it. And have that good experience, but we also failed in it where there's a few things we can build upon and learn from. Right. That's a part of the process. And I love, Mm -hmm. and I love that. I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show is this like, we're going to show up, we're going to make stuff and maybe it's not going to be very good. We're going to make a lot of mistakes. We're going to do it again and again and again. And eventually you get to the point where you said, you've been doing this for 20 years. You're like, oh, okay. Like that's how you do it. And you don't do it by getting it right the first time. You don't get it right by doing, you know, you don't get it by doing it right the second time necessarily or doing it right every time. And Michael Jordan said, I've failed more times than most people have even tried. Like just go ahead and fail. You might fail at a specific thing that you're doing, but the experience of it the doing of it is something you can't ever lose. You can't actually fail at doing it. You can fail in some other ways, but once you've done it, that in and of itself, you can't fail at. You did it. The only failure in action is the failure to be in action. Mm, totally true. And that's that's something that we also really attribute a lot of our success to is just going out and creating stuff. Like we never let the fact that we didn't have very many clients at the very beginning or like... Um, we didn't know what we were doing, stop us from making content. We always went out and just tried to make content for whatever thing we could. And we also now, like in our later years, we've created an online filmmaking course where we try to teach young filmmakers how to become filmmakers and stuff like that because we didn't have access to that knowledge when we were young and like film school is really expensive. And so we try to create an online course to help people like shorten that learning curve that instead of take like five or year five or six years to tell your voice, you can learn it in like six months or so. And but you it still has that element where even if you take an online course, you're gonna have to fail and you're gonna have to fail a lot because failure is a part of our job as, as creators. Like you have to fail to learn from your mistakes and someone can't just teach you every little aspect of it. There's still failure involved, so you still need to go out and create stuff. I agree 100%. And I'm glad you brought that up because I will say that we will put in our show notes a link to that course and there will be a discount for our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit about what the discount is and give us a little like the quick elevator pitch about the the course? The filmmaking guide is basically a 12 page booklet that goes over the basic settings of like camera, like lighting, something like an intermediate or a beginner filmmaker could really benefit from like on set. So like, let's say you're out on a shoot and you're like, um, you're trying to know if something is exposed correctly and you still don't understand, understand camera settings to know that right off the top of your head. So you can pull up your phone, look at that little handbook and it can tell you like what a histogram means, what a light meter means, how to determine if your aperture is open or not and stuff like that. I thought you did a really good job, Taylor. I, uh, I did look at it actually, as soon as you sent it to me, I was looking and my daughter is taking her first photography class in college. And she was being like, I'm a little confused about aperture and this and whatever. And I'm like, literally, as soon as I got that, I was like, I, I'd explained it to her literally like 12 hours before you sent that to me. And I was like, okay, here you go. Just, I just sent it right off to her. It was great. It's, it's a very good primer for a beginner. So, uh, we'll make sure mm-hmm. to put that in, in, in the show notes as well. Um, and I think at the end of that, that you'll see there's a link where you, that you can click to get a discount on the, on the full course as well, if you're interested in doing that. Sort of in closing, you mentioned an incident of being detained uh, by the Cambodian government. Yes. And I love this. I want, you to, I want you to tell the story. And I love it in part because I feel like once you've done enough of filming, basically, particularly in the indie world or the run and gun world, you've definitely run in 
to something like this. Like I, I was producing, I guess it was my second or third like indie feature. Um, and we had to, we were renting a, uh, you know, a detective's car. So it was a crown Vic. It was all black. It had, you know, it had, but it did have like the lights on the inside. Um, and so we rented it from a picture car company in LA that should have, you know, properly ingested the vehicle into their, in, you know, into their company. Well, they hadn't done that yet. So I went and I picked it up as I should have been able to do. And I got my little DMV transport sticker and all that good stuff on my way to set. I got pulled over. And the car was confiscated and impounded. And I have, we're filming, we had, we had permitted a uh, corner of somewhere on Ventura Boulevard in, in Studio City. So we're permitted, all the actors there, the crew is there. We need this Crown Vic to get these shots and I'm standing there and we can't afford to lose a day. Uh, this is a low budget project. I can't do that. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Think on my feet, think on my thing. And I'm sitting there like, trying to figure it out. I'm calling the director, I'm calling my other producer. And I look across the street and in the parking lot of a, of a, uh, an apartment building is a crown Vic. And I think, oh great. It's like seven o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay. And I literally go and I start knocking on every door and I get to the manager's door and the manager's like, uh, I have no idea whose car that is. I'm like, okay, fine. I keep knocking on doors. I, I, I knock on the store. This kid answers 16, 17 years old, 15, something like that. And I'm like, do you know who that Crown Vic belongs to? He's like, yeah, it's my mom. She just bought it yesterday. And I'm like, is your mom here? And she goes, well, she works the night shift. She's sleeping. I was like, dude, will you wake up your mother? Because I really need to rent that car today. <laughs> and he goes and she comes out and she's sleeping. And she's like, yeah, what do you want? I'm like, I want to rent your car. I will rent your car for the day. I hear you work nights. You don't need it during the day. I will take it. I'll bring it back. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to pay for the car. Your, I'll take your son so that you can make sure that we... You know, we treat it well. He can be a PA for a day. I'm going to pay him for the day to be a PA and I'm going to credit him in the movie. Uh, and I was like, and I will get you an insurance certificate like right away. She's like, oh, okay. Literally, I take this woman's crown Vic and her like 16, 15 year old son with me. And I'm like, fuck, yes. I'm like, and I'm like, guys, I'm on my way. And I pull up and literally I get a text message from her like a minute later and she just says, I just realized I don't know you and I sent you away with the two most valuable things in my life. <laughs> and I texted her back. I'm like, man, oh, I awesome. totally get it. I swear on my life that your son and your car are in good hands. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, that was uh, I'm just like, those, those kinds of things uh, are just kind of part of this process, thinking on your feet and also getting into trouble. So you got in, into trouble with Cambodia. Tell me about that. Yes. First off, I just want to say one of the reasons I love my job is like those moments where you're like, you just have those insane stories. Every, almost every set you work on has an insane story like that. In the moment, it sucks and it's really annoying and really like stressful. But afterwards, it makes for some really good like um, dinner talk type of things. <laughs> and now my Cambodia story. Oh, man, I haven't talked about this in a while, but it was just before um, the pandemic hit, I think. I think it was just like right before like all travel got locked down. But um, so this was a little bit scarier, I would say, than yours. But like um, so I was flying a drone in Cambodia for this news organization. I think I've talked about it already. And um, we were out getting some shots of the city and stuff like that. And we had like a translator with us. Um, and, um, I pop up the drone and the translator didn't like inform me that I couldn't be flying the drone where I was flying my drone and we didn't have permits. We didn't have any of that stuff. And, um, I apparently was flying the drone over the, uh, the equivalent to the white house in <laughs> Cambodia. I was flying the drone around that. Good job. So within like five minutes, I had like 15 cops surrounding me and I don't speak the language and I'm. And they're like yelling at me and I'm like pulling down my drone and I, I set it down on the ground and, um, I pack it up, put it in my backpack and they force me and well, and I'm just, it's me and the translator and we had like four other like filmmakers with us at the time and photographers and they were off getting their own shots. And I call my brother. I'm like, Hey, um, I'm getting arrested right now. And he's like, what? 
stay there. I'm like, no, I, I don't think I can. They're not letting me stay here. They're going to make me go with them in like two seconds. And so they all just came like running towards me. And my one brother, one of my brothers got to me before I got, had to get on the scooter and ride off. But they basically, so basically the cops made me get Hold on real quick. You were arrested back. on a scooter. Cause that's yes. already, that's already cool. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. So I, they made me get on the back of a scooter with the translator. So it was a cop, me and my translator on the back of this little moped thing. And they drove us to their police station. And, um, the only way my brothers found me is that they did find my phone and they followed the, they tracked me down through my phone or else they would have no idea where I went. And at the very beginning of this whole process, uh, so I was detained for over like 10 hours. And, um, at the beginning of this process, they were like, Oh, it's going to be like uh, a couple hours. You'll be fine. Write up a statement. Um, you'll delete the footage off your drone and you'll be good to go. And so we were all kind of like the, like I was in the police office station, my brothers were outside and we were kind of like joking back and forth, kind of texting like, Oh, this is going to be that big of a deal. Like I'm totally going to be fine. Like it's going to make a great story. And then like three hours goes by, they take my statement. I'm still sitting in this office. And then, um, they tell me that I have to go to another place to write down another statement and then they're going to now confiscate my drone and I'm not going to get it back, which that I don't really care about the company we're there for. We would just, because I'm on their dime, we would have them pay for the drone and all that stuff. That's, that's in our contract. And so then we go to the next place, which was three hours after I got arrested. And so now I'm getting a little worried, like what's going on. Um, but they again said, you get to this next place, it'll be five minutes. You'll be out the door and on with your life. And the next place they take me to is the cyber terrorist like organization of their government. Like, and I get in there and again, I'm, it's just me and the translator. My brothers can't come with me because they got to go and finish the shoot. So they had to leave me there and hope that I get out fine. And, um, we're in this, it's not like, it's just this office, but every time I stand up, like everyone else in the room stood up and just started watching me. So it was like very much like I was not, it, it was a lot bigger deal than they were trying to make it out to be to me. And I was there for another five hours and, uh, they basically told me the only way I was getting out of Cambodia was if a high level person in the government came and vouched for me and said I wasn't a terrorist. <laughs> Good. And it was pretty insane. It was probably the scariest moment of my life. And um, like there was so many times where I was like just shaking, just so scared. Like I even like I had to go use the restroom at one point and they had to escort me to the bathroom and had someone stand outside the bathroom for me. Like it was pretty intense. And um, and one of the lucky things for my wife in this situation is that she was asleep through this whole process. Like she was awake for the beginning, um, here in the U S she wasn't on the trip with me. And I text her, I'm like, Hey, I got arrested. And she's like, what? And I'm like, and then like a couple hours later, I'm like, Oh, it's going to be fine. It's totally cool. Cause it was in that good moment of the arrest arresting process where I still thought it was a funny experience. And so then she went to bed and then she didn't wake up until I was actually released. But there was like a moment there where I didn't think I was going to be released for a very long time. And luckily we found someone within the news organization we were with, they had connections in Cambodia to get a higher level person there. It just took a long time for us to find that person. But yeah, um, the moral of the story is make sure you have permits, make sure you can film a drone in that place. And especially if it's in a foreign country, you need to do that because if you can't speak the language, it literally is like the freakiest thing when you're like arrested and you can't speak the language yep. or, or if you can't get a permit, uh, learn how to forge a good permit. Uh, Werner Herzog talks about <laughs> forging, forging letters from generals down in South America. And, uh, at one point I had to film actually at an airport where I wasn't allowed to film and it was a weekend. And so I forged a permit. Because I'd had other permits, so I basically just, mm-hmm. you know, did a little photoshopping, and then of course the cops came. And like you can't be filming here. I was like, I got a permit, right? And they're like, Oh, okay. They look at the permit and they're like, Hmm, interesting. We haven't seen this one yet. We're gonna go. We're, we're gonna take a copy of this and go back to the office. And they go back and they're trying to like call, but because the permitting office was closed, it was a weekend. They couldn't verify. It. And I was like, At some point, guys, they're gonna figure it out. So we have like 
an hour and a half to finish getting our shots. And sure enough, you know, I forget exactly how long it was, but whatever it was, they kept, they kept coming back. And at one point I was like, they're going to catch us. So hour and a half, finish our shots. Sure enough, we got the, our last shots. We got out of there. I'm sure the cops came back to tell us that, uh, that they couldn't verify our permit. And by that time we'd gotten it. So, um, so That's either good. get a permit or, uh, or be really dang good at faking it. <laughs> yeah. And, Oh man, that's, that's funny. But yeah, it was a pretty, it was one of those moments where like when I left that building, I felt so happy. I've never been so happy in my life. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Sometimes you need those, sometimes you need those moments, the scary moments so that you can actually uh, realize just how lucky you are. Yeah. And again, so it makes for a good story on the back end. So, Hey, yeah. yeah, we wouldn't, we, yeah, we wouldn't be able to talk about it if it hadn't happened. So, and it's great for the rest of us because we didn't have to suffer through the fear. We just get to enjoy the story. Exactly. So, which is actually a, a good way to kind of just even kind of conclude this is that the you, you we've been talking a little bit about storytelling and these sort of challenges. And one thing I think that's just really important and, and your stories kind of uh, pointed to this is that the challenges and the the that we face along the way are vital to the story because we're also in our own story as as filmmakers as artists as creatives we're in a story and we want to be in a story worth telling and a story worth telling has moments where you feel like a failure it has moments where you get arrested it has moments where you're not sure what the outcome is going to be those make really good stories if our lives as creators are going to be worth telling. We're going to have those challenges. Sometimes it's going to push up against us to the point where we're like, oh, I can't do this anymore, or I'm no good, or I'm going to be stuck in a Cambodian prison for the rest of my life. Um, and then and then we kind of keep going. We find a way through that. That makes our lives stories worth living. It makes the stories that we tell worth telling. Um, and so, Taylor, thank you so much for joining us and bringing this little bit of your story, your path, your creative path, your journey, and sharing it with our audiences today. So thank you so much for being a part of it. Yeah, thank you for having me. 